So, uh, mathematics can make you fly. Um, this is uh, what I would like to discuss with you within the next 50 minutes or so. What kind of mathematics can make you fly or maybe more honestly, uh, the mathematics behind image manipulation. So everything uh, has started or the title of this presentation was initiated by this picture. So this photograph shows uh, Joanna who is a PhD student of mine and uh, uh, she seems to be flying. So how is that possible? And uh, the answer to that question is written here on the blackboard. Uh, the reason why Joanna can fly is of course not because she has supernatural powers, but because she has been sitting on a stool originally and we have used uh, some mathematical methods, in particular so-called partial differential equations, which are my daily bread. Um, we have used those to remove the stool and replace it with uh, something that is suggested by the, the rest of, the, um, uh, of, the, um, uh, of this photograph. And that can uh, create effects like this one. And uh, Joanna is not the only one who can fly, but this person as well. Um, this man is still alive today uh, because of course he wasn't uh, just flying, but uh, the spongy jumping rope has been removed by a similar technique as the one uh, that you have seen on the board before. And, um, <laughs> um, and uh, similar techniques um, can be used not only to remove uh, things which are, were originally in the picture, but also to remove uh, things like scribbles uh, over that someone nasty has put on this photograph and that can also be removed by these kind of techniques. And um, similar mathematical approaches that can make Joanna fly have applications uh, in a wide range of image analysis and image processing tasks, such as uh, increasing the resolution in um, medical images that come from devices such as uh, tomographic uh, devices tomographic uh, imaging devices, going from a picture like that to a picture like that. Um, segmenting uh, objects in images you're interested in uh, and maybe tracking them over time if you have a video. Uh, and in this case, what you see here are cells which uh, are in different states of happiness. Uh, here they are in the mitotic face, so they are about to divide, here they are dying, and here they are kind of in a standard uh, state, so uh, not much is happening. Um, so finding boundaries, segmenting those from the rest of the image, uh, again uh, techniques connected to so-called partial differential equations, and I will explain what that means in a second, can be used. Um, Another important task in image processing nowadays that we have so many different imaging sensors which are used to image one and the same scenery. Uh, think again about medical imaging where you go to the hospital and the PET scan is taken from you and then they take you to a different room and an MRI scan is taken from you. Um, to, to use these complementing um, uh, the complementing information from these two types of images together uh, requires a so-called registration, an alignment of these two images. Um, and what you see here is an alignment of uh, airborne images taken from an airplane, um, which are aerial photographs um, and hyperspectral images. So you have uh, hyperspectral images basically means you have uh, a resolution that goes beyond the visible spectrum so you uh, cover a bigger part of the light spectrum, not just RGB, but more of that. Okay, so um, I'm not going to explain to you how each of those methods or how each of the, these tasks is solved uh, uh, mathematically. Um, 
I will explain to you how one of those is solved, and we are going to focus on Joanna flying. Okay. Um, so all of this uh, research on developing these mathematical methods for all these different types of applications, you cannot do that alone. So you, my work is very interdisciplinary and we are working with biologists, with forest conservation people, with uh, art conservators, with clinicians. Um, and then of course it wouldn't be as much fun uh, as it is if I also um, if I also wouldn't uh, work with uh, students and postdocs and with a group of people who ha are having a lot of fun. And uh, uh, Chris already said that we formed the Cambridge Image Analysis Group and uh, the reason, one of the main reasons why we called ourselves like this is that if you abbreviate that, uh, it's the CIA. <laughs> okay, and uh, some of the pictures might hint towards this. Okay. So, um, the outline of the presentation is as follows. Uh, first, um, I'm going to explain to you um, conceptually, mostly conceptually, the mathematics behind flying, behind um, uh, these uh, different types of image manipulation. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to show you what you can do with these type of mathematics, uh, not just uh, uh, making Joanna fly, but uh, uh, to digitally restore uh, art pieces like frescoes uh, or illuminated manuscripts. And then uh, if we get to that, uh, if Chris uh, still lets me uh, go on, then uh, I'll show you some more applications in cancer research, forensics, and uh, some more special effects. Okay, so um, to, un to appreciate um, mathematical methods uh, that uh, can, manip can manipulate images, we first have to understand what a digital image is. So if you look at a photograph that you took with your cell phone uh, or with your camera, um, this looks like this. It looks like a very good quantification of uh, the continuous world. And that it, this is a quantification uh, you can see when you zoom in. So if you zoom into this red rectangle, uh, this red uh, 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 rectangular region here, you see this. If, you, if we zoom in a bit more, then you can see what this, uh, if it's a very high, highly resolved uh, photograph, uh, almost continuous representation of the world um, um, uh, is, is actually uh, just a collection of uh, so-called pixels that, that, that store a particular uh, color value that is given by R, G, and B, red, green, and blue, uh, and that make this pixel appear in different colors, and if you put them all together and you go, you, you know, you step a bit away from this pixelated view, you can see the image of the dog. So if, if we want to do mathematics with uh, digital images, um, we want to formalize them into mathematical objects. Uh, and this is what I'm doing here. So uh, if you think about your photograph uh, just as, an, as a grayscale image, then um, what, uh, how, how you can formalize this grayscale image is uh, in terms of a function that I call here u that maps a pixel in your image, which, um, is, um, uh, which is defined uh, by a pair of coordinates, one, two, two, m, and one, two, two, little n, um, that maps this pair of coordinates of a particular pixel here to an intensity value between zero, which is black, to 255, which is white. And if you do the same thing uh, for a color image, then instead of a scalar-valued function, which is this one, you have a vector-valued function where each pixel is mapped to a vector r, g, and b. And here you can just see different representations of how you can think of images as functions. Um, so here I've plotted the intensity in each pixel uh, as the height of a surface, and you can see that this gives you 
uh, you know, what you might think of as a function. Um, you can also think of this as a matrix, as a huge collection of numbers in, an, um, uh, in a two-dimensional array. And these are the kind of objects that we are dealing with uh, in our mathematical approaches. So um, the task that I would like to focus on in this presentation is the task of what is uh, called image in painting. So um, in this context, for this, in this problem, what um, we have is an image uh, defined on a rectangular domain. Um, and within this image, there is a region, which I call here the impainting domain or the hole in the image, which is either an object that I choose, like the stool, or an object um, or a part of the image which is damaged. And what I would like to do is I would like to use the um, uh, information, uh, the image intensities or the color values of this image outside of this domain um, to fill in uh, appropriate uh, colors inside. Uh, of this uh, so-called in-painting domain. So this is what I want to do. Um, okay. And I would like to do this, I've said that at the very beginning, with uh, so-called partial differential equations. Um, so what are partial differential equations? Those are equations of independent variables, uh, well, of a, of a function of independent variables and its derivatives. Um, they are based on uh, Newton's uh, differential calculus um, and they are uh, used to describe um, many phenomena in nature uh, that are based on uh, the change of quantities and the relationship of the change of different quantities. Um, so the equation that you see here is one of the most famous uh, so partial differential equations. It's the heat equation or diffusion equation. And what this equation does is that uh, it diffuses, um, um, uh, uh, it diffuses, uh, it diffuses uh, information um, encoded in this function u um, um, it diffuses that um, along, uh, um, um, uh, along time. So think about the following. Um, you are having your afternoon tea with a nice cone and you take your cup of tea and you pour milk into the tea. What you see when you do that is that the, when the milk kind of dissolves with uh, or mixes up with the tea, the milk diffuses into the, um, into the tea. And this is what this equation is modeling. This is what this equation is doing. Um, so when we apply this to an image, this is a very kind of uninteresting image. <laughs> um, it just consists of random intensities that I've put uh, in every pixel. When you start with an image like this and you evolve it along this heat equation up to a nominal time t equals 10, what you see is exactly this diffusion process which you can think of as a local averaging that is happening to these pixels. So when, you, when I go back to this equation here, what you see is that um, the heat equation relates the evolution of this function u to the flux of the gradient, of the spatial gradient of u. And this is what is doing this, um, 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 this averaging process here. So... Um, what you see here is um, that this equation, as I said, uh, involves the function and derivatives of this function. 
Let me just explain to you very briefly what derivatives of an image are and why those derivatives are important and why, um, therefore, uh, differential equations um, are useful to uh, encode information about images. So if you look at this picture here, uh, which is a grayscale photograph, um, and what I'm doing here is I'm plotting the intensities. Um, when I walk along this red line, I'm plotting the intensities of the pixels that I cross. And this is what, I, what I've plotted here. So these are the intensity values uh, plotted along this line. Um, so what does it mean to take derivatives now? And I want to do this first in one dimension, okay? So for this one dimensional, for, for such one dimensional uh, intensity functions. So if this would be my intensity function f that I would get if I walk along this red line, then if I take the first derivative of this function, it would give me something like that, right? If I take the second derivative, it would give me that. So what you see is that uh, these derivatives, what they encode are uh, where this image or this one-dimensional profile in this image is changing a lot. So it encodes the places in the image where something is going on. And where something is going on, this is where I hope that the most important characteristic information in this image is contained in. Um, if I now um, look at derivatives um, along this red line, and I look at the derivative along a line that is perpendicular to that, so in x and y direction, which are called partial derivatives, first partial derivatives of this function u in x and y, I take their, um, their absolute value and I sum them up for every pixel I'm doing this, and I replace the intensity in each pixel by the value that I get from there, what you can see is that um, what this image, this gradient image is giving you is that you see that it has the, 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 the largest responses where something is happening, where you have edges in your image, where something is changing. And if you look at the second derivatives, it's similar. Uh, that you can see where things are changing and in the, in the places where not much is changing, like here on, on the skin, there is not so much information hidden there. So, um, so this is what partial differential equations kind of encode. They encode information about uh, contents and images and they are putting these different types of information together in a way that models what you would like to do in your image processing task. Um, you can also think about what the heat equation is doing by um, representing, so the heat equation, the nice thing is if you look at the heat equation, as a, I've said the, one of the most important equations in mathematics, but it's also one of the most simplest in the sense that we understand what the heat equation is doing quite well. In particular, we can uh, explicitly compute solutions to this heat equation. Um, and if you start your heat equation, if you start off this evolutionary process of this uh, heat equation with an image that I call here G, then um, the solution of the heat equation at any time T can be expressed as a convolution of this original image G with a Gaussian kernel that I'm plotting here with uh, a standard deviation with a width that is uh, um, proportional to the time, to how long this image G has already evolved along the heat equation, which means that uh, this image gets smoother and smoother, gets more and more average. This is what this convolution is doing. I'll show you, I'll show you uh, briefly on the next slide. Gets more and more average the, the longer you let it evolve along the heat equation. Um, so this convolution you can think of, if you convolve this Gaussian with your image G, what you are doing uh, in the discrete world in, for digital images, what you, you are doing is you're representing this Gaussian with a mask uh, of a particular width that is related to your standard deviation. 
and with weights that are, that are related to the height of this Gaussian at different places. So in the center, uh, it's the highest value, and then you're decreasing as you go uh, further away. So convolving an image with a Gaussian means you're taking this mask and you're sliding it over the image, and while you're sliding it, you're, you're stopping at each pixel, you're looking at the center of this mask, and you are summing up, you are, um, you are summing up over the Gaussian uh, times these um, um, times the intensities that you see underneath the mask, uh, and then you divide by the number of elements in the mask. And you can imagine that what you're doing is you're replacing each pixel by a weighted average by doing this. So let's look at this. If this is my original image again, this is what I get when I convolve with a Gaussian of uh, standard deviation uh, equals to two, and this is what I get if I do this with a standard deviation equals five. And the standard deviation here again, uh, remember, is related to the time of how long I evolve this image along the heat equation. So eventually, if I would evolve that infinitely long. What would I get? Exactly, just a constant, right? Okay. So, um, this is just to make the point again. So, uh, this is this convolution with a Gaussian, but you get the same, uh, as I said, when you look at the solution of the heat equation for a particular time. Um, so how is this at all related to this original task of image in painting? Well, now just imagine that you're not solving the heat equation on the whole image, but you are only solving it in these domains uh, D with um, taking, uh, diffusing the gray values via this heat equation from uh, the surrounding of these domains D that are in this case these black boxes, okay, um, diffusing them into the black box. And then you get something like this. Okay, so you're only solving the heat equation now on these domains. Um, and that is quite nice. So you can do that. Um, and this is just to show you again that this is an evolutionary process. So you start out, let me go back again. So you start out with these domains and slowly the color surrounding these scribbles here is, uh, um, um, is diffusing uh, into these uh, black, uh, black areas in the image. Now, if the heat equation would be the answer to everything, I would be jobless, okay? Because I said already the heat equation is really well understood. So um, the heat equation is not the answer for everything because as you can imagine, the heat equation is only uh, modeling this diffusion process, which is a homogeneous process and it's, do, it's, it's, um, it's blurring the image everywhere in the same way. So this averaging process doesn't take into account structures that you might want, in, in the case of in-painting, might want to propagate. And this is a very simple example, okay? So here, I have this, think of that as a road, okay? So you have, you're looking at a road that is white here, and the in-painting domain D is this uh, gray um, circle here. And if I now apply a type of heat, if I now apply heat, um, the heat equation to in-paint that, it will not do the job because it's only trying to diffuse. It's only, try, it's only propagating information by kind of local average, by a local averaging process. Um, so this is, this is not good. In, so what, I've, what I'm saying here is that in particular where, dif, where just um, linear diffusion as in the heat equation has problems is when you have large gaps. Um, and then uh, the propagation of these structures um, is not possible. And this will in particular be obvious in, with large gaps because it will not look good. It will not look as you would actually propagate 
the information in this image. Okay, so several more sophisticated approaches have been proposed in the last couple of years. And if I say in the last couple of years, this is like in the last 30 years or something like this, where more or less this whole field of mathematics, in particular, uh, uh, people thinking about these differential equations um, coming into the field of image processing. Um, this is when this has more or less started. Okay, but when we think about these more sophisticated approaches, <clears throat> how do we do this? How do we model what we want, what this equation should be doing in the end? How, how, what do we want this equation to be doing? This is the main question. We need to understand this before we come up with an equation that is hopefully then doing something like that. So how to impaint? The original picture looked like this. <laughs> and this was this attempt to... <laughs> And I believe, uh, and I didn't look that up again, I should have, but I think it was a Portuguese uh, lady that did that. I think it was a church. It was, a, it was in a church in Portugal. Um, and uh, this um, name here, uh, so this is really the name of this picture, Ecke Homo, and this was kind of the joke name that was given to that afterwards. And the lady got quite famous, actually, with, with, uh, with her attempt here. So... Maybe something like this we don't want our, our mathematical method to do in the end. But maybe we want to do something like this. So here I'm, I'm um, marking the region, this region D, that I would like to fill in red. And this is the outcome of one particular uh, instance of these more sophisticated mathematical approaches to impaint images. Okay, so maybe this looks a bit more reasonable than this one. Okay, so how to do this? So if we focus first on PDEs, on these partial differential equations, what do we want? And the interesting thing is the first um, uh, researchers, the first mathematicians who wandered off in this arena of image impainting actually came up with their differential equations, uh, with their particular differential equation by talking to art conservators and learning of what they are actually doing. Um, and so the main point in what they're doing is what it's actually, you know, intuitively you would, you would probably also approach it like this. So you have a part in an image that you want to replace or that you just, you know, because it's damaged, you want to, um, you want to restore. Um, so what you're doing is you're looking at the structure, at the kind of information you have surrounding the whole, this impainting domain, and try to continue as much as possible these structures into the whole. Or, in other words, what we want to do is, if you think about um, contours, let's say edges, um, with the same intensity arriving at two different sides of the hole, you would like to connect them in a kind of smooth way. Okay, so if you do that, and unfortunately I will not have time to tell you everything about partial differential equations and how they come about, but what you need to basically do is you need to make this heat equation approach much, much, much more complicated by adding nonlinearities and more derivatives of your uh, image function u to it. And if you do that, then, and again a very simple example, then you can get from uh, a, start, uh, uh, a starting image like this, where this is my impainting domain, from a solution that we had already before, this is the heat equation solution, to something like this which is still not perfect, but it looks actually much better than this one. And you can see that this is actually really paying off by looking at this picture here. Um, I have lots of dogs in my talk because I kind of like them. Um, but so in this case, this is my impainting domain. Okay, someone has uh, scribbled again over this image. 
Uh, and this is the result of this more complicated approach. So let's have a look if this is really now so different to uh, if I would have used just the heat equation. And for that, I would like to zoom in this area because this area is the one where you might have structures that the heat equation destroys. And indeed, it does. Okay? So here you can see what the heat equation would do. It's this local averaging process, right? It's, try, it's just trying to diffuse information. And this is what this more complicated partial differential equation is doing. Now, going back to Joanna, um, and zooming into the area where we have removed the stool, this is what you get with this more complicated uh, diffusion approach. Um, and again, it, this is not perfect, but uh, it's what the equation gives you. You, could, you, don't, don't, you are not restricted to using diffusion. You could use, instead of diffusion, you could use other mechanisms um, in dynamics, let's say, which is transport. You don't diffuse, but you just take pixel intensities and you transport them in a particular direction. Okay? And then this is what you can get with something like this. And this is just an illustration of this filling process with a transport, so the tr a transport equation um, that is used for, on the previous slide, looks like this. And what you're doing basically is in an iterative process, you're filling in, and this depends in which order you fill in, uh, you're filling in bit by bit uh, by just transporting intensities along. Okay? So the different mechanisms encoded in different types of these partial differential equations that can be used, and they give different results. Now, these partial differential equations, again, they're not the answer to everything. So, you know, not even uh, if we have now advanced, we uh, have gone beyond the heat equation, that they're still not the answer to everything. And the reason is that they are propagating local information. They are taking intensities around these holes that you have in your image, uh, around these impainting domains, and they are propagating it into this impainting domain. But this also means that if you have repetitive structures, like um, in the fur of the cat, these type of approaches will not be able to recreate these repetitive structures because they are local. So um, in this case, what people have thought about is not to use these local differentially, which the, these differential equations which um, encode local changes in your image, but to use um, global information to look in other regions of the image and try to synthesize within these damaged parts um, um, regions um, in, in the part of the image uh, that is uh, intact, that is outside of this domain D. And here, this is just um, uh, a, a visualization um, uh, of how this works. So in this case, this is my impainting domain. Sorry for the change of notation. So this is the impainting domain. This is my very, very simple intact part, the, everything outside of this impainting domain that I call here the source region. And the idea now here is the following. We start with a pixel on the boundary of this impainting domain. We draw a box around this one. And we look in the, in, uh, in the part of the image outside of this impainting domain. We look for uh, uh, patches um, with the same dimension as this box here. We're looking for patches which look similar in the region of this box, which we know. Okay, so we compare this with the regions in these boxes and then we just copy it in and then we iterate this process. And although I'm not going to write this down, this is, you know, looks more like a discrete process, a copy and paste procedure, this can actually be formalized as well 
in the, continuum, in the continuous world in terms of a non-local differential, uh, differential equation. Okay, but I'm not going there, just to, just to say that, and then you can get results like that. Okay, okay so now a few uh, applications. And the first one I want to focus on is uh, arts restoration. So this was the very first project during my PhD. I'm originally from Austria and I did my PhD, I started out my PhD in Vienna. Uh, and these are the so-called knighthood frescoes, which are medieval frescoes in, um, in an old building in the city center of Vienna. Um, which have some history, let's say. So Neithard, uh, Neithard von Reuenthal was um, a minnesinger. Actually, is this the same word in English? I don't know. Yeah, it's the same. So these guys, you know, in the medieval ages who went from castle to castle and uh, sang songs about what they have uh, experienced on their journeys. And um, so these uh, frescoes showed or, or um, visualized some of the stories in the songs of this minnesinger, okay? And this minnesinger in particular was singing the stories of this minnesinger were about relationships between knights and maidens and so on. So they were really profane stories and as such profane frescoes. So at some point, to cut the story short, the church got hold of this building and they really did not like this and they just overpainted them. And it, uh, when they were rediscovered, when the guys removed the paint, they also removed parts of the fresco. Um, and so what we did was not to restore those frescoes physically, there were art conservators who did that, but to collaborate with those and similar to this first PDE that I was mentioning, where the guys talk to the art conservators to understand how to do things, we talked to them um, and uh, developed a method which produced a digitally restored version of these frescoes. Um, and here we really, uh, you know, went uh, from this local in-painting procedure, from this local in-painting strategy, to the more non-local in-painting strategy that we have seen, this more global approach. And we did that in the following way. So if you look at one particular detail in this fresco, we, um, we looked uh, at this particular structure here and we first, um, we first restored the structure, uh, only the structure uh, here in this, um, 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 in this in-painting domain. So we first just restored this structure and then based on the restored structure, which is in this case now this one, we synthesized, we kind of copy and pasted textures from the respective parts from inside and outside of the structure into the, into the hole. And this, and this was the result, okay? And this is now, you can see, actually, if you, if you now go, this is, this is the actually physically restored fresco. If you now go to Vienna, you can, uh, you can look at them. So they are there. Okay, other examples. So this is now from my time here in Cambridge. This is, uh, this is a painting uh, from in, which you can now see in the Fitzwilliam Museum, fully restored. Um, which the Fitzwilliam Museum, or in particular the Hamilton Kerr Institute, which is uh, this uh, restoration institute uh, associated with the Fitzwilliam Museum, uh, this is the state they got it in when they initially got it. And when I talked, uh, so in this case uh, it was Spike Buckler from the Hamilton Kerr Institute, when I, when, I, when I spoke to him the first time he said, look, this will take us a long time. We don't even know how to start. This is, this is really, really bad. I mean, and actually digitally, we didn't solve everything here, as you can imagine. I mean, we are not, we are not magicians, let's say, right? But let me show you what you can do by zooming into one particular area, which is this one, the head of this shepherd here. 
Uh, and this, I have to say, was a, um, the work of a visiting student from Paris uh, who was with us for six months. Okay, so, and here we did a similar thing. We first used local in-painting to close the small damages in the image. So if you go from here to here, we first closed all these cracks and little holes that you have in the image. And then for the larger gaps, we did a kind of two-step procedure where we first used a kind of diffusion approach to uh, get the rough um, information, the rough color values inside of these large gaps. And then we initialized that again, we constrained the more global in-painting approach with the colors that we got from the local in-painting. And then you get something like that, okay? Another example. <coughs> so, so this is, this is also interesting. So, this is again a result of prudency this work here, or this collaboration, the reason for this collaboration. So this is an illuminated manuscript or, or a detail of an illuminated manuscript that they have in the Fitzwilliam Museum. Um, and it shows um, this, the biblical story, okay? So this is a manuscript from the 16th century. Uh, and this was a, the, a present to Claude of Francais who, um, um, who was at, at that time five years old or something like that. Yeah? And it, you know, what you see here is uh, the, uh, the story of the creation of the earth. Um, um, Adam, um, uh, Eve is built out of Adam's rib. Uh, this is the next stage where God is uh, telling them the rules in paradise that we know that in the end they break. Um, and this is, this, this is how this manuscript looks like now, okay? But what they found when they looked into the details of this and in particular used uh, imaging technology which can look through the invisible layers um, of this manuscript, what they found was that actually originally Adam and Eve were naked, as they probably were in, universe, uh, in paradise. Yeah? So what we did here was, the, the important thing is that with illuminated manuscripts, they will never touch them. They will not remove physically these uh, skirts. And actually, both the skirt of, uh, of Eve and of Adam, everywhere they were overpainted at some point because, again, of prudency, okay? So this, this, uh, this primer came into the hands of someone else at some point who uh, didn't want to see them naked. So what we did was we, again, an in-painting technique. So we marked the skirt of Adam in this case as our in-painting domain. But then we used the structural information we got from the infrared image and use that to guide the solution of the PDE, how this should propagate the color values into the in-painting domain. And then you get something like this. And this is then the whole, the resulting, the, the end product, let's say, where Adam and Eve are again naked. And this even, you know, was featured in The Guardian. And it said, Adam and Eve naked again after centuries old cover-up. So, yeah. And you can see that also exhibited in the Fitzwilliam Museum. Okay, so what we learned um, was that mathematics can be useful to restore images. And in particular, these partial differential equations, which work on a mechanism of diffusion and transport of gray values into these in-painting domains, into gaps in the image. And we can use them in a variety of different settings to make Joanna fly, or to restore frescoes and paintings and manuscripts. 
And the practical impact, I would say, really for the art conservators was, uh, so remember, Spike told me, we don't even know how to start. So this is one thing. You could, you know, with these digital restoration methods, you could give them a kind of template of how, if they would do things like this, how this looks in reality. And if you think about the illuminated manuscript, this is the only way how you could represent how this manuscript might have looked originally. But there are many other areas of sciences um, where um, these concepts of image processing with these methodologies come in. And I will maybe just show you one or two. Yeah, few, um, okay, a few minutes, great. Okay. So, we have seen that already, special effects like making Joanna fly. Um, similar things can be used um, uh, if you look at satellite images, for instance, and you're interested in, in this case, the roads that you see from a satellite. Uh, but those roads are covered up by clouds or trees or something like this, and you want to get rid of these. Well, you can use similar mechanisms, okay, to get rid of trees and images of roads, for instance, to get back just a plain road. And this, this is useful if you, for instance, want to create a road network. And again, you know, these diff type of differential equations come into the game here. Forensics. If you go to a crime scene, you might maybe not often go to a crime scene, but imagine you come to a crime scene, usually the type of fingerprints that you collect there are far from perfect. So they might look like this, but then when you think about if you now take your fingerprint and you want to match it with another one in a database, what these, class, you know, these matching uh, algorithms are doing is they're looking at these structures, at these lines in the fingerprint, they're looking at bifurcations and endings, and this is how they are matching with another fingerprint. But here, they're all destroyed. So you can use differential equations as well to enhance fingerprints like this, to go from a fingerprint here to a fingerprint like that. And let me say this is really totally automatic, okay? So I'm not doing anything here manually. Um, Diff, kind of different conceptually uh, is very often in medical imaging what you're measuring with your medical imaging device, like in this case magnetic resonance tomography, is not an image directly, but is a transform in this image. And usually, because you only have a finite amount of time, the patient doesn't want to lie in this tomograph machine for too long, you're not acquiring all the necessary measurements, but you have gaps. And this is, so in, in the case of magnetic resonance tomography, in the, tr the transform space you need to interpolate in is the Fourier space, the frequency space. So here you're not interpolating spatial information, but frequency information. Um, and the frequency that you have given here is here given in the red dots, and everywhere else you need to come up with it. And uh, this is what also these kind of um, uh, differential equation methods can help you with. Um, let me jump over that. This is just another interpolation example where on the basis of height values of a, um, uh, of a digital surface, you are, which might be quite sparsely sampled because of certain budget requirements you have. Maybe you don't have so much time to acquire them. You don't have so much storage to store them. Or you don't, just don't have good enough sensors. Uh, you only have this, but you really want this. And so how to go from there to there is again based on these type of uh, image in painting methods. I'll certainly skip this because I would like to, sh to finish with this kind of fun example. Um, which is image fusion. So this is now very different to image in painting, but I'll make you know, the link back to image in painting in a second. But what do we want to do here? So here we have two photographs of two people, uh, of Obama and Reagan. And what we want to do is we would like to merge those two faces in a certain way. So what we want to do is we want to be able to 
uh, on the one hand, spatially select which parts of the face from Obama I would like to put onto Reagan. For instance, do I want to equip Reagan with Obama's nose or, with, or do I want to equip Obama with Reagan's eyebrows? And I would like, so I would like to spatially select and I would like to select in terms of which uh, structures in the image I would like to map onto the other person's face. Um, the scale of the structures I would like to map on the other person's face. Do I just want to map the skin color, the very large scales in the image, uh, onto the other person's face? Or do I want to map the, the wrinkles in Reagan's face onto Obama's face? And this is one result of doing something like this, where we have chosen the fine scale features of Reagan's face, the wrinkles, and mapped them onto Obama's face. We mapped Reagan's nose onto Obama's face and his eyebrows. And this is the result. Um, and this is the other way around. So here we made Reagan younger, kind of. <laughs> OK. And just to say this scale separation of going from just skin color to wrinkles, to the very fine scales, is again related to being able to separate these different scales to the diffusion equation. Because when you think about what the diffusion equation is doing, it's going from the complete, all, an image with all the scales to images with larger and larger scales. So the fine scales, they get lost more and more. And by taking very simplified explanation here, but by taking differences between those, you can extract different scales in the image. Okay, so this is more or less the principle here. And you can do lots of fun things with that. Uh, so this is the Mona Lisa. What is this? Can anyone guess what we did here? You have seen the person already that we mapped here onto Mona Lisa. Yeah, it's Reagan. <laughs> uh, and you can, you can put Reagan onto lots of different places. <laughs> so... The, the, do you know what that is? It's the statue of Brazil, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is Reagan mapped onto, <laughs> onto that one. <laughs> Reagan mapped onto the Statue of Liberty. Reagan mapped onto, do you know who that is? Mount Rushmore, exactly. And that's Washington, I believe. So you can do lots of fun things. Um, and because we are mathematicians, uh, this is, uh, and for the numerical analysts among us, there is a numerical method which is called Gauss-Newton iteration. <laughs> uh, so this is, uh, this is Gauss, this is Newton, and one of those is the Gauss-Newton iteration, right? Either this or this, right? So here we have fused Gauss with Newton in two different ways. And with that, I would like to finish. Um, what I concealed, because I didn't have enough time, and I think uh, I would need, you know, you would need to go through a whole curriculum of undergraduate studies to, um, 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 to be able to, to conceal this, is that, or to be, be able to unveil this is that these equations are really beautiful mathematical objects and their analysis, and in particular also their numerical treatment, are challenging and very interesting tasks. And if you were intrigued about this and the younger people among you interested in doing a PhD in this area, uh, look at uh, the website of our new institute. Um, and for those who want to learn a bit more about that, uh, I'm now already old enough to have uh, my own book on, on the slide. <laughs> um, and with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention.